All right. Well, welcome and thank you for joining us today at the 2022 Ohio Nutrition Incentive Network Annual Convening. Um, if there are any sessions you've missed but are interested in, you can still register for any session and receive a recording. We will share a link to the register uh, to register for those in the chat box now. We are beginning each session with a land acknowledgement, which we have sourced from the Ohio State University Office of Diversity and Inclusion. The land acknowledgement recognizes and respects the relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their ancestral and contemporary territories. We acknowledge that the state of Ohio occupies the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. These lands were ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We also invite you to add your pronouns to your displayed Zoom name or share them in the chat box now. If this is your first session with us today, the Ohio Nutrition Incentive Network is a multi-sector coalition working toward a shared vision of affordable access to healthy local foods and a healthy, equitable, and resilient Ohio food system. We represent diverse regions of Ohio and collaborate to advance nutrition incentive programming statewide. We will be sharing a full contact list early next week with recordings and notes from all sessions. Today, ONIN members have a specific background and have included ONIN in their profile names. Our network is looking to expand and diversify. If you are interested, please contact Anna Bird at Produce Perks Midwest. Her email is in the chat box now. Okay, it's time now to begin the content of our session. We have, we have reserved time at the end for Q&A, um, but ONIM members are monitoring the chat. Feel free to put any questions in the chat as they arise. We'll answer them if possible, um, but we'll also take note of any questions that are a better, better fit to be answered in a live session during Q&A. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Haji. I'm the board chair of the Ohio Farmers Market Network. And uh, OFMN is a statewide leader for farmers markets, their managers and vendors, and a proud member of ONIN. Today, I have the privilege of facilitating outside the box solutions, presentations from nonprofit and for-profit organizations that create flexible solutions to address community needs. And with that, allow me to introduce our speakers. Joining us today are Anna Kiss Mauser Martinez, Executive Director of City Fresh, Tom Redfern, Director of Sustainable Agriculture at Rural Action, and uh, Sasha Miller, for owner of Purple Brown Farm Store, was meant to be here today and unfortunately um, could not join us at the last minute. So um, we will, we're of course missing Sasha, but we are excited to have Anna and Tom. Thank you so much for being here. Um, before we jump in, we'd like to give both of them a few moments to further introduce themselves. Um, and Anna, let's start with you. All right, I'm going to share my screen, so hopefully this works. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Anakis Mels martinez Anakis. Uh, I'm the executive director of City Fresh, a local foods nonprofit working to create and promote a more healthy, vibrant, and just local food system. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, City Fresh sells affordably priced farm boxes of fruits and vegetables at 15 pickup locations throughout Cuyahoga and Lorain counties. Um, shares come in two sizes and at tiered prices and are purchased a week in advance, usually online or by mail. We operate for 20 weeks, uh, June through October, but we also have a few extra uh, weeks at the end of the season as climate crisis has actually made uh, Ohio a little bit warmer for a couple of weeks longer. So we have uh, two bonus weeks and two holiday shares at a at three of our locations. Um, 
Like I said, they come in two sizes, family or singles. Family shares feed three to five people and single shares feed one to two. We accept SNAP. Um, we participate in many different uh, nutrition incentive programs and we offer our own tiered pricing. So we are already kind of operating as a um, incentive program on our own, which we do at 200% of the federal poverty level. Those folks get a limited income discount. Um, the way that we work is people sign up and then we go to the farms and then we bring it to our location, our pickup locations or fresh stops. Uh, we have six core farmers all located within 70 miles of the city of Cleveland. They use low impact farming and uh, focus on soil health for their soil is their legacy for their children. We work with mostly Amish farmers. Um, our fresh stops are volunteer driven and operate as sort of a community hub for folks to swap recipes and tips and um, argue about whether it's a yam or a sweet potato and um, try to figure out if the five different colors of Swiss rainbow Swiss chard taste different. Fun things like that. Um, we have delivered we deliver 150,000 pounds of fresh local produce every year since 2005-ish. I think that grew a little bit since our first year, but um, to 900 unique customers, more than 900 unique customers. Uh, so those folks order at least once throughout the season. In 2021, we had 935 unique customers, but those also um, represent households. Uh, and again, we go 24 weeks altogether. 25 to 30 percent of our shares are sold at sub subsidized um, the subsidized rate and are subsidized by us through grant programs uh, or partner programs like produce perks and um, produce prescription and the TNF perks and so on. Two thirds of our pickup locations are located in limit low access areas, so it has long been. Um, the goal of our organization to focus on the areas most in need. And we generate more than $100,000 of income for small farmers annually. And again, our fresh stops are run by volunteers. We have a very large network of volunteers and we're super grateful for them. Uh, I started as a customer, a low-income customer on SNAP myself with two small children back in 2007 and then became a volunteer uh, in 2008 and eventually sort of worked my way up to be entirely comprised of vegetables. Um, we focus on uh, nutrition and health. Uh, community building is a huge part of our project and we kind of see all the problems that are fit with, um, that folks face when it comes to social determinants of health and climate crisis as really interconnected, that these are two parts of, of the same thing and uh, that so is economic injustice and racial injustice, et cetera. Uh, so that is why these, these are our core values. Um, environmental resilience, social equity, economic justice, all the solutions are kind of intertwined as well as the problems. So uh, you can find us at cityfresh.org. And um, I'm excited to chat with everyone today. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'm going to share my screen and we will go now to Tom. Give me one second, Tom. All right. Oh, let me unmute you, Tom. There we go. I'm Tom Redford. I'm the Director of Sustainable Agriculture for Rural Action. So Rural Action is a membership-based nonprofit that works in the Appalachian counties of Ohio. And um, next slide. Okay. So and we have so rural action has multiple programming areas, all based around asset-based community development. So we have a sustainable agriculture program, plus watersheds, plus forestry and energy, you know, all 
working around assets that we have in our region, how we can improve what's basically one of the poorest regions in the state. So that's our mission. And so basically we have a food hub, which is a produce auction, which is also a social enterprise of rural action, which is the Chester Hill Produce Auction. So over the years in an effort to grow that and also to address issues of food access, plus put money into the farmer's pockets. We serve over 100 farmers annually, all from our region, who bring to the produce auction. We've created what we think of as demand channels or ways to make markets to bring the aggregated produce to people. We have two refrigerated vehicles that we use. We have AmeriCorps service members, but plus we have two paid positions for drivers who buy from the auction, work with the end user, to feed, so to speak, these demand channels, which are farm to school, which includes like farm to institution also, because we sell to Ohio University and pre-COVID we were selling to Ohio State, but also like six to seven K through 12 schools. Plus we do a project that we call produce prescriptions where we're partnering with two healthcare providers, Copeland in West Virginia and Hopewell in Ohio. So this year we put produce from our producers into 325 households, as you can see, in, in nine counties. Plus we do this thing which we call Country Fresh Stops, which is basically farm to corner stand, I mean, farm to corner store. And we also partner with pop-up model in two hospitals. Plus we do a uh, buying club, which we also have like scholarships and fundraising we do to make that more accessible. So for this year, we had like 200 buying club participants in three counties. So these are our ways we aggregate, then distribute local produce. Next slide, Jamie. Great. So here's the scene. You can see the produce auction. Producers bring in produce. Mainly horse and buggy producers, but also non-Amish producers. Over 100, you can see the bulk produce. 
we're serving as like a buyer, plus other buyers are coming. To Morgan County, which is very rural, southeastern Ohio County, where we've created because of the produce auction, we're bringing people there. So we've made like a destination and like a community place. So since uh, 2009 or so, the produce auction has brought Three point eight million in sales to Morgan County. These demand networks are a way we leverage that too. So you can see when we're talking produce prescriptions or buying club, basically in twenty twenty we had to think of like. more contactless options for distributing food. So we began to pack paper bags. So these paper ba bags would be with mixed produce from the auction in season. So you can see that's a lot of work. Then they're loaded in trucks, and taken all over the region. Next slide. So this is the, uh, you can see the vehicle, that's our uh, refrigerated van. So that's going to Parkersburg, West Virginia to serve a uh, produce prescription run by Copeland Health Centers. So, and, and you can see on the right is this year we had a partnership with the uh, Southeast Ohio Food Bank who purchased $50,000 worth of produce over the season from the Chester Hill so weekly, we would be bringing that to them. They, in turn, were serving their food bank, which serves food pantries in 11 counties in Southeast Ohio. So our produce was really getting the range. And it, it was really important this year because People were having, you know, the normal supply chains were really slow this year. So having that local access to produce really helped their, their clients. And you can see on the right is a, uh, there's an AmeriCorps member working the pop-up market. At, pop-up market at Ohio Health of Blennis, which is really important because you're talking about like a workforce, which is really stressed, hospital workers, long hours. So it's really a good way to give access to healthy food to people that might not have the time to get it. So next slide. So this is a slide of our like farm to school work. So we partner with the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks or ACENET, which has a shared use infrastructure for processing. So basically what we're doing is purchasing it the peak of the season and then preserving the produce through 
freezing or preparing it, you know, bagging the lettuce or like dehydrating apples to be later distributed to schools when they're in session. So next slide. And then thing I, I'd like to mention real quick too is that when you think of the innovations that rural action has, the really big one is that we work within a partnership, which we call the Appalachian Accessible Food Network, which includes which includes ACENET, who I mentioned, plus community food initiatives. So we all kind of we share funding, we share and, and work to coordinate each other's efforts, not to overlap, but to serve more people. Plus we have a shared use position who works with all three groups, which really keeps us working together. So that's a big innovation we have. So I think that covers it pretty much to start. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. All right, let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom and Anna, uh, for those brief introductions. Uh, of course, you are both doing so much work in your communities. Um, for anyone who is interested, you can learn more about um, Tom and Anna, their work, their um, organizations, also um, that of Sasha and uh, Purple Brown. We are dropping their websites in the chat for you um, as well. So uh, let's chat. This session is about ideas that are non-traditional, um, ideas that are new and fresh pun intended. Uh, so my first question for both of you would be um, sort of what is, the, what is this niche that you're filling in your communities? Um, what, what was missing that helped to bring your ideas to life? Um, and we can start with either, you know, I'll give Tom a little break for a second and we'll jump back and forth. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I think that the main the, the main missing piece for us when we started in 2005, there was a lot of interest around local foods. Um, there was a lot of uh, folks getting together and wanting to access local foods. There weren't really any, um, there are very few traditional CSAs in the area. Uh, we were sort of the first aggregator um, in, in Northeast Ohio. And there were a few collectives, but it, it operated a little differently at that time. So the big the big difference, though, is that um, local foods weren't necessarily accessible to everyone. Going to the farmer's market can be a very, um, it's a touristy, fun thing to do um, on a Saturday afternoon, but it, it doesn't make necessarily mean that that food is affordable for good reason, because food costs a lot of money. Actually, farming as a uh, I'm, I'm sure Tom is familiar with, uh, and probably a lot of our audience uh, as well, um, is, is very costly, uh, doing it sustainably um, with, you know, the, the challenges that climate crisis presents and that weather in general presents uh, is, is really, really challenging. And it means that food costs a lot of money. And we have built a system that uh, diminishes those costs through subsidies and various uh, systemic metrics. And um, our, our program really wanted to focus on um, attacking at the time, which was the, the food desert uh, terminology. So the low access areas, um, you know, there was this awareness coming about um, of the fact that grocery stores and fresh foods had moved out of neighborhoods and we wanted to sort of address that and to make um, local foods also 
uh, affordable for everyone and not just the, the few who could participate in that as a sort of boutique experience. So that is our tiered pricing program. Um, the fact that we accept SNAP, this was the very beginning of that sort of happening at the market level and our, we use the share um, mode mo uh, model uh, to, to package shares to, to get people really connected. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And, and Tom, same question, but also to add on to that is, you know, you talked about this coalition that you have. And did the coalition, were they established and they came to you? Did you go to the coalition with this, this idea? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that as well? No, we actually kind of grew up together, you might say. So we were like nonprofits working together with shared and overlapping missions. Basically before my time in, into the late 90s. So you know, working together, but in like 2012, there was a funding opportunity through the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville, which really kind of brought the three of us together. The first stage we sat down and worked on a theory of change as a unit. And, and began to plan. The second phase was how could we take these demand networks, which we all had in the, like the infrastructure that ACENET has, like community food initiatives, you know, has their roots with community gardens, but they also have a big program they call the donation station, which purchases from the Athens farmer's market and also from the Chester Hill produce auction and then serves it out to food pantries. And these days they have a project, the veggie van, which is basically a mobile market that sources from the produce auction and, and local farmers. And it's basically like a pay what you can model. Plus they work with us to host a buying club. People can pick up their buying club shares at the veggie bank as an example of our partnering with infrastructure. But to go back to your question, the big thing was hosting that, the shared use position. A person, a human being, who's working with all three of us, which is, mm -hmm. I th think it's a novel concept, but has been really helpful in making sure like, who's doing what, who needs help, where's this going, you know? Yeah. Working yeah. with the funding opportunities. Yeah, that common thread. Yeah. So it's, you know, holding up that common thread as a team. So we meet every Friday, you know, real transparent. So not being like rivals, but being partners in a shared mission. Which is, yeah, that's that it. is. That's so incredibly important. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's easy to get lost in all of our own work, right? And you, you all right. put that aside and come to the table and recognize that your work is with one another. Um, exactly. I, I want to ask, so, you know, given that uh, our programs are, in fact, unsustainable, uh, right? They require the effort and the input of a lot of people, a lot of money um, coming in. Uh, it, it is not self-fulfilling here. Um, how can individuals support the work that you're doing? Just an individual um, who likes what you're doing, how, how do they support something like this? 
Um, one of the first things that we need everyone to do is participate in these various things. We need you to buy local foods um, to, to become customers. Um, the, there's so many ways to engage though. Um, we create nutritional um, education materials. Um, so some of the basic ways is to follow us on Instagram, you know, help us with the algorithm to reach people. Uh, but we have things that are available. We have free printables that we've created. Um, and we, we want people to use these things. If the infrastructures um, aren't used, they go away, right? So that's, that's how you do it. Um, if no one rides the bus, then the bus stops all its routes. And I think that as we begin to build this new local foods infrastructure, which of course is not has not entirely disappeared, but has to be rebuilt because we've globalized everything. You know what we have to do is we have to ride the bus, so we can engage in it in so many different ways. Whether that's simply commenting on an Instagram post, or whether that's donating funds, or volunteering once or um, finding ways for your organization or your program or one that you know about um, to partner with organizations like ours. We're, we're always looking for those sorts of opportunities. Um, we can't obviously act on all of them because of our limited capacity, hence the unsustainability part. Um, <laughs> but you know, we can build on what we've done before and I think grow. Um, we, this is a long-term project. Uh, feeding humanity and doing it safely and with a, a safety net. Uh, and to do that sustainably, we need we need input, we need dollars, we need participation, uh, and we need your, you know, sweat, blood, and tears as well. Yeah, yeah Tom, how about you? Really, I think that's really well put, Anna. I mean, buy local it starts there, right? Shop at your farmer's market you know, seek out local farmers. Specific ways you could help us, like when we're doing the buying club, which is what we call our subscription shares, people can buy one to share, you know. So if you are in a position to share local food, please do it. So, and, and, Our three organizations with the Appalachian Accessible Food Network, as an example, all host many volunteer opportunities. Plus we all three host like national service members, like VISTA and AmeriCorps programs. So, you know, when you're thinking about policies and, you know, be really supportive of that federal support of giving people an opportunity to serve their country. I would add, um, sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I also want to add, you know, with election day looming, it's important to vote with your, uh, your conscience and to support uh, policymakers that support the goals of um, addressing social determinants of health and um, systemic inequality and uh, addressing climate crisis. Uh, these, these things are all really intertwined. And if you're writing letters or sending dollars to the people, I mean, we had some local politicians in our uh, keynote address this morning. Um, so super important to also, you know, do the work in other ways. There are lots of folks participating in all manner of ways. And that's that's another one you could do. That's very well yeah. put. And you, Go ahead, Tom. Plus that can be at the school board level, the township trustee level, all kinds of levels. You know, the thing is historically, the farm bill, sustainable agriculture, agriculture in general, has historically been a place where we can all meet together nonpartisan. So we all have to eat. So hopefully we can share that as a thing that brings us together. So share food is a way to get, 
work with your neighbor, you know, regardless yes. of the flag they might fly, share food. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we're, we're, we're going to open it up to questions in just a minute here, but I want to ask at least one more uh, um, of each of you, because, you know, we're, we're here under the, you know, the, the theme here of our nutrition incentive programs around the state. Um, and I, I wonder for maybe those on the call who are thinking, you know, something you said, your whole idea, the whole thing, a little bit of it, all of it, it piques their interest. And so I'm wondering if they want to do something similar in their community. Um, what would be one piece of advice, but then also one cautionary tale that you might share with somebody who wants to do something similar? The thing I would say is don't be prescriptive over how you might do it. The beauty with us, with the produce auction is, and with the demand networks, basically we were just thinking of a way, how could we aggregate produce to basically get the local food system at the wholesale level, at the institutional level, because you look at a county like Athens County or Southeast Ohio, pretty much in general, much of the food we consume is by institutions, right? From schools to universities to hospitals. So how could we connect that? So basically we had like boots on the ground working in Morgan County, looking at, you know, ways we could do development, but just meeting people. So the idea of a produce auction was brought to us by the participants, by the farmers. I had no idea what a produce auction was. So, but people wanted it. So the best ideas always kind of sprout from the ground up would be one suggestion. I would add to that that I, I view our program as very much a community building project, um, sort of at its center. And, you know, food food is about um, being with other people, you know? I mean, I, it, the history of agriculture exists because of community. So, um, you know, we have to be together to break bread. And um, addressing the needs of the community means listening to the community and means... Um, being responsive and uh, iterative in your processes. So, con you know, these are living um, projects. They are not destinations that we're going to go into communities and tell them how to exist. Um, it's about, you know, collaboration and community at its soul. Um, for cautionary tales, um, I suppose that sort of is a cautionary tale that you cannot be <laughs> too prescriptive, as Tom said. Uh, you know, and uh, transportation is a major issue. That's that's my cautionary tale. Uh, buy a really nice truck. <laughs> find, find all the money for a nice truck. <laughs> and basically have the tow truck driver on speed dial. Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, okay, good points there, good points there. Uh, so we're going to open it to questions, and I want to start with one that is in the chat from Andrew. And Andrew asks um, of either of you, what are the regulatory hurdles for packing and distributing food um, that you need to overcome? And are those regulatory hurdles, are they through local health departments, the ODA, some other organization? Can you talk a little bit about that? I can real quick. So in terms of the, and basically like you're always hoping that you're not doing something wrong that you might find out about. But uh, so with the packing of the fresh produce, because we're not altering it in any way, 
you know, we're just putting it together. We've not run into any regulatory hurdles. But in terms of like the institutional sales we do since about 2010 or so, we put a lot of emphasis on training in good agricultural practices, you know, like each year we do a training, like a gap training, food safety training. And we also, since about 2018 or maybe 17, we've been partnering with a third party gap auditor. So the produce auction itself has the gap certification and about six or seven producers we buy from also have it, which they advertise that on their product. So people can know if they want gap certified. And the other piece, when we do the processing it, which we do for farm to school, the freezing or whatever, we pay for a license from the Ohio Department of Agriculture to do that. So each year we're inspected in that process. So even though it's, we're doing it at ACENET, we still have to hold our own title. So. Anna, how about you? Uh, well, like Tom, we, we mostly, we don't do any um, value added stuff or processing, we just use uh, produce straight from the farm and then maybe put it together. Very often we just literally take it from one bin onto a table or on into another bin. Um, we are careful about food safety uh, and, but we don't have, there's no regulatory um, restrictions um, on us for that. We're also pre-order. So that makes even vending a little different than it typically would. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you both so much for answering that question. And I, I do apologize because we we have managed to run short on time. Um, <laughs> and there's another question that just popped in. And um, I would love to get to it, but I'm afraid we're going to get cut off. And I don't want that to happen. Um, I, I do uh, apologize for not having time to open this up more thoroughly to questions. Um, but we did share the contact information. There will be a list following up. And I do encourage you because so much of this work um, should really be talked about and it should be talked about more frequently and, and really get uh, you know to their points. It's about community. Uh, so uh, I do want to thank you for joining us today and hope that you found this session informative and inspiring. Um, we hope, hope you'll join us for our happy hour reflection section, which uh, once again, added session titles and links to register in the chat. Um, if you have any trouble registering or accessing the Zoom, um, please contact Dana. Her email will also be in the chat. So we're dropping a bunch of stuff in the chat right now for you. If this is your last session of the day, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. We hope you'll be follow or will be following up next week with session recordings, notes, contact information. Uh, we hope you've been inspired and intrigued or intrigued uh, by what you've heard today. And we look forward to connecting further with you. Thanks to all of you for being here. And Tom and Anna, thank you so much for the work that you are doing. And um, we look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks so thank much, you. Jamie. Thank you so much.